Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so this talk about is about how to remove the strong RSA assumption from arguments over the integers. OK, that's not what I want. And um, so you know what a commitment scheme is. Uh, there is a sender that has some message. You can lock it into a box. And the box hides the message. You cannot see what's inside. But at the same time, when the sender later uh, reveals the message that's inside the box, he cannot change his mind the message. So what we'll look at today is a commitment scheme that has been introduced in 1997 by Fujisaki and Okamoto, uh, who, which has a nice property, which is that it allows to commit to a message M, which is over a group of unknown order. And uh, this has proven very useful. Uh, it, it, this commitment scheme was used in a large number of applications, just to name a few. It was used for, to build MPC, anonymous credential, e cache, range proof auctions, password protected secret sharing, and so on. So the main reason why it enjoyed all those applications is, uh, well, there are two main reasons. The first of which, those groups of a known order we are talking about naturally occur quite often in crypto. Because if you take like uh, an RSA group where the uh, modulus is the product of two safe prime, then the uh, subgroup of squares of the multiplicative uh, uh, group RSA um, are of a known order because knowing their order is equivalent to knowing the factorization. So essentially, this kind of groups of unknown order naturally occur in crypto as part of larger systems. And in these cases, the, this commitment scheme might, uh, in general, can prove useful. But another reason, maybe the core reason, is that if you can't commit to an element over a group of a known order, intuitively, the committer should be bound to the value over the integers. Because if later he is to reveal the committed value, he cannot reduce this value modulo the order of the group, which is unknown. So he somehow will have to reveal this value over the integers. And this has many applications when you want to uh, deal with statements, work with systems that will work with really integer values. So for example, if you want to consider a statement of the kind uh, proving that some commitments commit to a value which is bigger than 10, this is a non-algebraic statement. So it's not easy or efficient to do that uh, with uh, standard commitments over, uh, say, prime order groups. But if you can directly commit to integer, then uh, it becomes way easier to handle that. And in fact, those applications that I listed here are not, are not directly based on the Fujisaki Okamoto commitment scheme, but they are mo uh, mostly based on a zero knowledge argument of knowledge of an opening to this commitment. So a proof that the prover knows a witness that allows him to open a Fujisaki Okamoto commitment. And so this is the basis for um, a large number of applications. But the issue is that, well, the Fujisaki Okamoto commitment scheme has nice properties. Uh, it's perfectly hiding. Uh, it's, it's binding under the factorization assumption. On the other hand, uh, the security of the zero knowledge argument of knowledge of an opening to the, Damgat, to the uh, Fujisaki Okamoto commitment scheme uh, is a bit less understood, it was proven to hold under an assumption which is called the strong RSA assumption. So without giving many details uh, right now, let's just say that it is a less standard assumption than, for example, the RSA assumption, and uh, in some sense, less desirable. And so this means that all those applications that I mentioned that directly rely on this zero knowledge argument of knowledge uh, have also a security that reduces to the strong RSA assumption. So our contribution in this work was to uh, revisit the security argument, the security proof for this, this zero knowledge argument of knowledge, uh, more precisely the security proof for this soundness, for the witness extraction procedure. And uh, we've shown that, in fact, the same protocol can be proven secure under the standard RSA assumption instead of the strong RSA assumption. And I insist on the fact that we've not made any change to the protocol. It's not a new protocol whose security is relies on the RSA assumption. So all the applications that I mentioned directly benefit from our improved security analysis, and their security uh, can now be proven directly under the standard RSA assumption. So how do we do that? Before I enter in all the details, let me give some preliminaries on the RSA groups. So we will consider Zn, where n is the product of two safe prime. And we will look at the subgroup of quadratic residues mod n, which is the subgroup of squares. 
um, the multiplicative subgroup of squares. And its order, as you can see, depends of p minus 1 and q minus 1, which means that um, it is unknown, because knowing this order is equivalent to knowing the factorization. So what kind of assumption can we have in such uh, groups? Well, the most natural one is the factorization assumption. Given uh, the modulus, it shouldn't be feasible to find in polynomial time uh, its factorization. Another very standard assumption, a widely studied one, is the RSA assumption. Given some uh, u and some exponent x, it should be computationally in infeasible to find some v, so that v to the x is u modulo n. And in fact, when I state it that way, it's not directly a single assumption, it's more like a family of assumptions, because I've not explained yet how we uh, pick the exponent x, how it is sampled in the assumption. And several flavors are common in crypto. Maybe the most common one in the theoretical community is just to assume that the exponent x is picked at random uh, over the uh, uh, entire range, uh, up to some constraint of being uh, co-prime with, um, with phi of n. Uh, while in practice, uh, what the most common practice is to pick a fixed exponent, like that one, and uh, to stick with this exponent. So, what we will consider in this talk is neither of the two. We'll consider a variant of the RSA assumption uh, in which the exponent is sampled at random, but in a small subset, in a polynomial size subset. And the last assumption I want to describe is the previous one, the one of the on which previous work wa were based, which is a strong RSA assumption. The strong RSA assumption really looks like the standard RSA assumption in the sense that the prover also has to find some uh, root of some challenge u with some exponent x, mod n. But the core difference is that now there is no uh, issue anymore uh, on how we will sample this exponent because the choice of the exponent is entirely left to the adversary. So the adversary must solve intuitively some RSA challenge for any exponent of its choice. And what makes some of this assumption maybe less desirable than the standard RSA assumption uh, is that there are, for a single challenge, for a single u, there are exponentially many solutions that uh, a prover could come up with, while whatever the way x is sampled, in all the flavors of the standard RSA assumption, there is only a single valid answer. Although we do not know how to break the strong RSA assumption, it makes uh, it seem a bit less uh, desirable as a search assumption. So uh, that was for the preliminaries. So now let's uh, dig into um, this um, security argument for the uh, extraction, for the knowledge extraction of the um, the knowledge argument of knowledge of an opening for a Fujisaki Okamoto commitment. So now you can see what the commitment looks like, and most of you might recognize something which is exactly like the Peterson commitment scheme. A commitment is a t to the m h to the r. The only difference is that now we're working over a group of a known order, which is a group of quadratic residues, mod n, instead of, of a p um, prime order group in the case of the Peterson scheme. And the argument of knowledge is, again, exactly the one you might be used to, the, the Schnorr protocol, uh, where the prover first sends a random commitment, receives a challenge, this is a, this is a sigma protocol, and then computes some linear answer using his witness and um, the, the random coins and the challenge. And the verifier will perform some check on top of that. And if the check passed, then he accepts the proof, then he is convinced, convinced that the approver knows some pair MR, so that G to the M, H to the R is the, commit, the committed value. So how, how do we usually prove the soundness, the knowledge ext extraction of this protocol? Uh, in so usually the standard method is to say, well, if I am, if Alice is playing, well, if um, the, the verifier is playing with a malicious prover, then he will be able to extract a valid witness uh, using rewinding. So by using rewinding, essentially, the two last flow will be repeated twice so as to cancel the randomness introduced in the first flow. And by doing so, uh, essentially, we can compute MR as follows. Well, but e here we have a, there is an issue, which is that we cannot compute inversions. We cannot compute. Uh, we cannot divide, because those uh, the t e are exponents uh, over in a group of a known order. So it is infeasible to compute uh, to extract this witness directly. 
So instead, we'll have to uh, provide a refine argument for that. So let me put that aside. And so instead of trying to uh, prove unconditionally that this protocol is sound, I will try to prove that the soundness holds competitionally. So we will replace our verifier by a simulator, whose goal will be to either extract a valid witness in an interaction with the malicious prover, or to solve an RSA challenge sent by some RSA oracle. And if you can do one of the two, then we are we are we are fine, and the, we can prove that way that the uh, soundness of the protocol relies on the RSA assumption. So again, we're going to use rewinding. So the two flows are repeated twice. And to simplify a bit the notation, this E0 minus E1, Z0 minus two, uh, Z0 minus Z1, and so on, I will just rename them, them Z, E, and T. So we have a relation where we have concealed the randomness. We have this come to the E is G to the Z, H to the T. But as we know, we cannot divide by E, so we cannot just compute Z over E and T over E to get a witness. So we'll have to consider several cases. The first one is the easy case. Uh, e divide z and e divide t. In that case, we can just divide over the integers and return a valid solution uh, to the commitment. Um, it, I'm hiding a bit, of, I'm glossing over some technical details. So there is also the issue of this sign, which is just a technicality. Uh, but essentially, uh, we can just uh, use z over e and t over e as a witness, and we're done. Now there is the uh, non-trivial case. The second case, where either this E doesn't divide Z or it doesn't divide T. So I just cannot compute my witness directly. And for this case, um, there is a nice argument. So before that, let me just rewrite this G to the Z, H to the T, as H to the alpha Z plus T. H to the alpha is G. So we have this H to the alpha Z plus T. And there is a very nice argument that was uh, used in 2002 by Damgard and Fujisaki to, s to show that in this case, if probability 1 over 2, then E cannot divide alpha Z plus T. Why does it all? Because this alpha was picked at random by the verifier before the protocol in some large enough set so that H to the alpha only, ne only leaks intuitively the first half of the bits of alpha because uh, alpha is way larger than the modulus of the, uh, uh, of the group for the exponents. So this probability is an information theoretical probability. Whatever the adversary does, uh, when E doesn't divide Z or E doesn't divide T, there is a probability at least 1 over 2 that E doesn't divide alpha Z plus T. And why do we want that? Well, because, again, without uh, showing all the details, in this case, we can apply a nice trick, which is uh, known as Chamir's GCD in the exponent trick, and find some pi and some V. So that v to the pi is h, where h is essentially our challenge uh, to some sign. And I'm, I'm showing the, the, the formula for the pi because it will be important to notice that pi divides e. Pi is some value that divides e, which is the difference of the two challenge sent by the um, simulator. So up to some sign again. Um, when this happens, we can solve a strong RSA challenge. Um, with an exponent pi. But as you can see, this exponent pi depends on d and t. It depends on the answer of the prover. So intuitively, it's not obvious that we could force the malicious prover to solve an RSA challenge for a fixed, uh, for a challenge of our choice. Somehow, he has some freedom in choosing the exponent with which he will solve the challenge. And in fact, we do not prove that we can force him to use a fixed exponent. But our result uh, starts from this point and relies on a crucial observation, which is that pi cannot be too large. The exponent with which the malicious prover will solve the challenge cannot be so large. Why cannot it be so large? By, by so large, I mean it cannot be bigger than 8 over epsilon, where epsilon is the success probability of this malicious prover. Why can it be that cannot it be that large? So recall, as I showed you before, that pi divides e, OK? So in this case, we will uh, rewind the protocol once more. We will uh, rewind it a third time, hoping to get a third accepting transcript. This will happen with some non-negligible probability. And why do we do so? Because, well, there was this uh, come to the e where we couldn't divi divide by e, so I'm just removing come entirely. 
So now I get two equations, come to the ESG, to the ZH, to the T, and the same one with the new rewind. And by doing some cross product, I can just remove the part that depends on the commitment uh, and get some relation. G to the A is H to the B, or some AB. So with this relation, intuitively, um, so we, there is a, uh, a null theorem that explains that if we can find some pair AB, so that G to the A is H to the B, then we can solve the factorization. Unless the pair that we find is trivial, unless A equals B equals zero. This is the bad case. So what I'm going to show is that when pi is too big, this bad case cannot always happen. And if it cannot always happen, then we can solve the factorization with some non-negligible probability. Why cannot it happen? Well, uh, just rewriting what does it mean for A to be equal to B to be zero, essentially what this means is that the same exponent pi will be uh, always the same. The exponent with which the malicious prover solve the strong RSA challenge will remain consistently the same in uh, several rewinds. But it cannot easily remain consistent, consistently the same. Why? Because we know that pi divides e. Similarly, pi prime divides e prime, by definition. He is constructed that way. But e prime is random somehow. Pi is some fixed value now, and we're doing a new rewind. And this e prime is a new difference between challenges that are picked uniformly at random by the simulator. So what is the probability that some fixed value divides a random big, big value? Roughly the inverse of the value. So essentially, the probability that pi divides a random e prime will be roughly uh, epsilon over 8. But you know that over all the, the that epsilon transcript out of all transcripts are winning transcript for the malicious prover. So as only epsilon over 8 of them are transcript in which pi uh, divides e prime, most of them must be transcript in which uh, pi doesn't divide e prime. And in this case, uh, pi cannot be equal to pi prime. So to sum up, it gets a bit messy, but essentially um, we can show that a, a large fraction of the, of the winning transcript of the malicious prover cannot possibly uh, verify pi equal pi prime because essentially e, pr e prime is a bit too random for that and pi is too big to divide consistently a big random value. So if we are in the situation where pi is too big, then uh, we can factor the modulus with a one over polynomial probability. And so under the factorization assumption, we know that this case cannot happen. If this case cannot happen, then we can assume that pi is small. Pi is smaller than eight over epsilon, but then we're done. Why are we done? Because remember that we're considering a variant of the RSA assumption where the exponent is picked uniformly at random in a small set. What small set? Then you can guess it's between two and eight over epsilon. And what we ensure is that in, during the interaction between the simulator and the malicious prover, no information at all leaks on this exponent x. So this exponent x is uniformly random, so our malicious prover will indeed solve a strong RSA challenge, but there is some non-negligible probability that the strong RSA challenge that he solves is exactly the RSA challenge that we received from the oracle, because that one is small enough. So we know that with at epsilon a probability proportional to epsilon, w um, he will solve our RSA challenge, even, even without knowing that he did. So overall, we can either extract a pair MR that allow, uh, what, that's a witness for this commitment, or with some probability which is uh, related to epsilon cube, we can solve an RSA challenge. So uh, that, that was it, and essentially this result, I focused on the case of zero-knowledge argument of knowledge uh, of an opening, but it extends to essentially any zero-knowledge argument uh, for integer relations, so for relations between uh, committed values over the integers, and in particular, it extends to the very interesting case of uh, range proof. Uh, and those range proofs are many interesting applications. So range proof are proving that some committed value uh, it belongs in some uh, range, belongs in some interval. So range proof are many interesting values. So in particular, they um, are used in many of the uh, applications that I mentioned in one of the first slides. So Essentially, our results extend to a large number of uh, systems that rely 
in one way or another on uh, zero knowledge argument over the integers, and it shows that their security can be based on the RSA assumption instead of the strong RSA assumption. The paper also contains a, a second part, another contribution which is uh, quite independent, where rather than looking at the security of the zero knowledge argument over the integers, we focus on their efficiency. And I won't ha have time to uh, cover that in details, but so I invite you to read the paper because it's also an interesting part. Uh, essentially, we, can, we, we show that we can convert a Fujisaki Okamoto commitment, which is an integer commitment, into a uh, what we call a Gennaro commitment, because uh, we found that in, uh, for the first time in a paper of Gennaro, which is a commitment modulo small prime. And essentially, we use that inside a zero knowledge argument of knowledge to reduce uh, the uh, size of the object we're working on, but after the prover has committed over the integers. So essentially, the prover will be bound to values over the integers, but all the verification will be performed by the verifier modulo a small prime value because, of, because intermediately we are converting those commitments to commitment modulo small values. And so by doing so, we can make the um, verification of those zero knowledge proof way more efficient. For example, for the case of range proof, the um, computation of the verifier is like 10 times slower, uh, 10 times, sorry, uh, more efficient. And uh, so just to mention, for example, an interesting open problem. Um, so we know that there are very interest, uh, there are many results on building short uh, RS uh, signature whose security reduces to the RSA assumption, but those signatures are usually non-algebraic, so it's not easy, uh, they are computationally not, not that efficient, it's not easy to build um, to uh, build um, proof of their, uh, to pr uh, proofs of top on top of it. And so while we have very good strong RSA-based signature, which are algebraic, which are short, so for example, could it be possible to adapt our technique to build some strong RSA-based looking signature whose security could in fact be reduced to the standard RSA assumption? And that concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention. Any question? Uh, there. Yes, please. Is, is your reduction uniform or non-uniform first? And then the wh how is the concrete uh, security loss of the reduction? Is so it terrible or is it So okay? the concrete security loss, so uniform or non-uniform, I'm not sure. Um, because I'm not sure exactly of what it means precisely. If you can. Let's take it offline. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, but so the concrete cost of the reduction is uh, essentially epsilon cube over 100, where epsilon is a winning probability of the adversary. So it's essentially we lose the factor epsilon compared to the previous reduction that uh, reduces to a strong RSA. Yeah. 